Okay, so let's start. Um, good afternoon, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this talk by Jernforsch. Jernforsch, that's right. Uh, more or less. Um, which is part of the Pythagorean Disputes series, which is hosted by the Center for Advanced Studies at the uh, at Boston University of Technology in collaboration with the International Center for Formal Ontology um, at the Faculty of Administration and Social Sciences, also at Boston University of Technology. Um, so, um, and the media partners here are uh, Philosophy, Philosophy Magazine and uh, the Cafe Art Blog, which is hosted by members of our group, uh, one of whom I see in the back of the room. Um, so, my name is Heil Greif. I have the honor of chairing this session. Um, I'm a member of the Philosophy of Computing Group, which is um, developing, I must say, at, at um, the ICFO. Um, and now to introduce Peter. Um, he's a philosopher with very much interdisciplinary interests. Um, and when I asked him um, how he would describe himself, like in a nutshell, he said, um, a renegade philosopher. I think that's um, <laughs> renegade philosophy is a nice characterization. <laughs> Um, it still hasn't kept him from being awarded with several prizes of being elected to the Royal, uh, Royal Academy of Sweden, the, the, the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, in terms of philosophical contributions, his to <coughs> fame is the theory of conceptual spaces, which he has developed over many articles and at least two monographs um, over his career. Um, but then, to tell my little story about uh, how I got encountered Peter was um, that being a philosopher has uh, also brought an interdisciplinary interest in uh, both the philosophy of artificial intelligence and uh, the evolution of cognition. I kept running into work by uh, Peter. And first, I first had to make sure it's the same person, and I can confirm it is the same person. Um, uh, so his interests are, are very broad. Um, and now, without uh, much further ado, um, I will go on the stage to Peter, who will talk about using concept and spaces to model the dynamics of empirical theories. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I guess I shouldn't have told you that I call myself a renegade philosopher. I'm actually employed as a cognitive scientist for many, many years. Uh, but today I will pretend I'm a philosopher of science. <laughs> so I'm getting back to old, old things. I was a lecturer in philosophy, philosophy of science for many years. Uh, so basically I'm taking some ideas from uh, cognitive science, my own ideas about conceptual spaces, and applying them to modeling things in within philosophy of science. So if you look at how we represent the information in cognitive science, you can make a distinction between three different kinds. And the classical type is by symbolic representation. That's how it started, with using logic or some programming in languages uh, to, to represent the information in robotics or in linguistics or whatever. The idea is that you have, in, in some kind of form of language, you have a set of predicates, you have a set of variables, you have a set of operators on these variables, and then you can combine them with syntactical, logical operators. And uh, that's the standard, what's called a symbolic uh, uh, model. One major problem here is that where do we get the predicates from? I mean, in logic, you, you, you put in your, your variables and you don't care very much where they come from. But if you're a cognitive scientist, you want to know how you can learn things. You can learn generalizations and uh, information. And this is never answered, really, within the symbolic tradition, where the predicates come from. Uh, there are other problems when you try to implement this in robots, you ended up with a frame problem, but I don't want to talk about that. Then, in the 1970s, this was from the beginning, in the 70s there was a second kind of information model developed, and that is connectionism, where you have a network of neurons, they all work independently, they have some kind of input, and they can slowly learn, they send information between each other, and they can learn to categorize things and, and, and solve certain kinds of problems. They can't really reason very well these networks. Uh, and you have to train them on a, on a large number of, of, of examples. But we never really know what's, what's being represented in the network. It's very, they are very opaque, they're very difficult to, to come up with. And in, in general, learning is very slow, otherwise the network wouldn't be disabled. So 
as humans, we actually learn to understand new concepts, new ideas very quickly. It's very difficult to mimic this in, in a neural network. So these were the two dominating paradigms. Then I and some other psychologists proposed what I call conceptual spaces, where you instead have some kind of geometric representation. So I like this being part of the Pythagorean debate, uh, because we go back to geometry as the mode of representation here. Uh, so I, I will talk about what I call quality dimensions in, in a couple of uh, examples. And we use notions of topological geometry to define uh, structures here. Uh, I'm sorry, this shouldn't have been where the predicates come from. It's, uh, it's a misspelling. It should be where do the dimensions come from and where do we get these underlying dimensions. That's the main, uh, main problem here. So that's in this, in this writing. Uh, anyway, I wrote a book some 20 years ago called The Conceptual Spaces, where I presented this theory. And uh, as I said, we organize the information in terms of quality dimensions. I mean, these are qualities like, like colors, space, time, temperature, shape, and weight, and so on. We, this is mainly to represent psychological uh, information. And I call these uh, domains. I mean, space is a three dimensional thing, color is also three dimensional. Weight is one dimensional, and so on. So here is a very trivial example of two quality dimensions. We think of time as being isomorphic to the real life. Uh, that's the Western conception of time. That's how we use it in physics and, and uh, in mathematics. We think of mass as being half real life. We don't talk about negative masses. So that has, I mean, it's still a, a one-dimensional structure, but it has a slightly different structure from from, uh, from uh, time. These are very trivial examples of quality dimensions. Um, another idea here that I will come back to in, in my application to physics is that, is that the dimensions within the domain are integral. They hang together, so to speak. Uh, the different domains are separable. What this means is that you can measure or determine the value <coughs> in one domain without bothering about the other domain. In psychology, there are good criteria for determining. So, so in instance, if you're listening to a musical tone, it has a pitch and it has a strength, say. Uh, but these can be independently determined from other, I mean, it's totally independent from color, it's independent from shape and so on. Or if you talk about colors, they are independent from weights and so on. I mean, the, we, we talk about within a space, dimensions are integral and then they are separable between domains. So that's how I define a domain, actually. Now, these domains come with some kind of structure. In the weak case, it's a quality, stronger assumptions are metric. But they are not only Euclidean structures. So I have as an example here, the human color space. And this is how we can represent, how we perceive colors. And it's a three-dimensional space. You have uh, one dimension which is the color circle going from red to blue, to green, and yellow, and so on. And that's circular because you can talk about complementary colors, colors being opposite one another. And then we have the dimension of uh, brightness going, I should have written white up here, down to black. And then the third dimension is intensity. Here in the middle is gray, and then you have more and more intense colors. This is determined from human perception of color. You ask people, don't have to look at two different colors and ask them how similar are these colors. And based on such similarity measures, you can reconstruct the space, multi-dimensional scale or some other method, and it will look something like this. It will have these uh, three dimensions. That's an empirical fact. Other animals, other species have two-dimensional color spaces. Some bird and fish species have four-dimensional color spaces. So we happen to have a three-dimensional perception of, of, of color. Uh, there is nothing unique about uh, this. So this is an example of a psychological domain, space, three-dimensional domain. Now, that's psychology. Now, I want to take these ideas from, from how to represent information or structures into empirical sciences. Like, I mean, I, I, my prime example here would be Newtonian particle, particle mechanics. So, uh, but in the philosophy of science, we have a discussion about what, what is a theory, what is a scientific theory. And if you look at the 20th century discussion, in, in, in particular in the positivism, from Karnap, Popper, Hempel, and everybody on, 
Uh, it, it's a set of sentences. They wanted to use logic to represent them, universal sentences, existential sentences, inferences, inductive inferences in terms of sentences and so on. Everything was formulated in sentences and logic was the general tool to be used to understand what's happening in, in, in theory. And that program has, is still running to some extent and we've learned a lot from it. Uh, but then came Kuhn in the 60s and said that this doesn't work because uh, we have scientific revolutions, there are paradigms and then uh, this paradigm is replaced with another one, there are abrupt changes and, uh, and uh, so the positivistic story about adding new laws all the time, some kind of accumulative uh, knowledge growth didn't work according to Kuhn. Then he never really defined what is meant by a theory. I mean, he talks about paradigm, but some other people have talked about theory course, but uh, there hasn't been very much of a formalization within, within the Kuhnian uh, tradition. So later, in the, in the 1970s, I think, we got structuralism that used set theory, and they say that the theory is a set theoretical predicate. And, uh, in my opinion, that's not a very illuminative uh, description of a, of, of a theory. Uh, but still, I mean, they, they developed this set theoretical sort of notion of, of theories and theory changes. Uh, School in Munich is maybe the most uh, well-known uh, uh, place for, for this uh, uh, story. And um, yeah, I don't want to get into the details of structuralism. But these are three different accounts of, of what the theory is. Now, my aim today is to give a fourth account, and that's based on uh, conceptual spaces. So, for me, a theory, the, the structure of a theory is, a, is a, a dimensional space. And on top of that, you can formulate laws. But laws will no longer be, be sentences. sentences. They will be geometrical constraints and stuff like that. So they will be, they will be uh, expressed differently. So this is what I want to do, give you a new account of what the scientific or an empirical theory is. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, so let me just go back to Kuhn, because the work, by the way, I forgot to say that this work I did with Frank Senker, who, when we did it, was a postdoc in Lund. Now he's affiliated with this, uh, this uh, institute here. So there are good connections between Lund and, and, and Watson in that way. Kuhn, wrote that revolutionary changes cannot be made peaceful. He thinks of this as a very big jump. Either you belong to a paradigm or you don't. I mean, there is, these are very big structures. He talks about the change from Newton to Einstein is maybe the main example in his, in his book, but he also talks about going to the to Newton and some, some other examples. I will use the, the shift from the Newtonian um, particle mechanics to the Einsteinian special relativity as my, my study, case of study here. Our case of study, case study, I should say. Uh, so, in normal change, you, you uh, yeah, in, when you change the paradigms, there, there are big changes. Within normal science, change science, you can have additions of laws, like he mentioned, Boyle's law, and so on. Uh, so, he says that in a revolutionary change, you must either live with incoherence or revise a number of, of interrelated generalizations together. There is no intermediate resting place. And we want to show that this is wrong. If we look at the development of Newtonian mechanics, there are several intermediate places going, preparing for the uh, change to relativity theory. So it's, it's not as constant as a school wants to the picture it, it here. So, uh, we want to give an account of scientific change and so on. So, the framework of a theory can be described uh, by the dimensions and the structure. That's the, the building blocks of, of, a, of a theory. And I want to argue that we can see different changes within the, this kind of uh, structure. So I, I'll give you these examples very quickly. And that makes these transitions, these changes, makes the developments of a theory more peacefully than, than Kuhn wants to describe it. So that's the... Uh, so this is my main example, Newtonian particle mechanics. There are 
eight dimensions. They are fairly, fairly well defined. But we have three dimensions of space, it's a Euclidean space. Uh, we have time, which is a one dimensional time, isomorphic to the real line. Uh, we have mass, as I mentioned, it's a one dimensional body. We only talk about positive numbers on, on, on masses. And then we have force, which is also a three dimensional space, a vector space, if you like. It doesn't matter very much how it goes. These are the eight dimensions that are involved in, in Newtonian particle mechanics. Nothing more, nothing less. And in, in the original uh, version. And they are divided into four domains. The space domain, the time domain, the mass domain, and the force domain. Two are one dimensional, two are three dimensional. That's the underlying structure. Everything is Euclidean. Um, now, Newton's second law connects all of these eight dimensions. So you have the force dimension, you have the mass dimension, and the acceleration is the derivative of the space with <coughs> respect to time. Second derivative here. So all eight dimensions are involved in, in, this, uh, in, in this equation. And you can view this equation as a hypersurface on the eight dimensions. That they put constraints. And this gives you, I mean, the eight dimensional space is, is rich, but this equation identifies the surface on the, uh, on the eight dimensional space. And what the empirical content of the theory is that it says that all observations rely on this hypersurface. So the hypersurface constrains what we can possibly observe. That's the, the empirical flavor of the, of, the, of the theory, so to say, that this equation defines the surface where all observations will be found. Now, we'll get back to observations in, in a while. But I hope you see that this is my, our idea of a theory. You have a space and then you have equations that put constraints on what is possible empirically. That's, that's the idea of how to represent the theory using a, a, a conceptual space. And it, constraints are very often formulated as equations, like, like the Newtonian second law. Okay, and then of course, in physics you define a number of other, other uh, uh, dimensions. I mean, this is all, all standard, the velocity, the, the river, first derivative, the acceleration, second derivative uh, of, of, of space, momentum, kinetic energy, and, and work, and so on. Standard definitions. They all are based on the, on the eight uh, fundamental dimensions. Um, so, uh, I talked about uh, dimensions being integral and separable. And in Newtonian mechanics, you suppose that all these, dimen all these domains are separable. Uh, so, uh, and one way, in, 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 in psychology, you do this by all kinds of measurements on how we perceive, how we perceive uh, uh, sounds and colors and so on. But in physics, you can do it by the invariance classes. You can define the, the, uh, the separability by invariance classes. So for Newtonian mechanics, it's the Galilean transformations that are the that are the, the, what they find. So it, you, you can separate, uh, separate the transformations from space from the, separate, uh, the transformations for time, which is uh, very trivial. So this is how we would define uh, integral and separable in, in, in uh, these kinds of uh, theory. Uh, yeah, so for example, in Newtonian, space and time are separate. But when we get to relativity theory, they are integrated. Now we can't use any longer use the, use the uh, Galilean transformation. So, uh, but there is something else. Uh, so, that's one way of characterizing the difference between these two theories. I'll get back to that uh, in, in, in a while. And also, this separability connects to what measurement procedures are, are uh, available. So, in Newtonian mechanics, there was various methods of determining the mass of an object. But it was assumed that mass was independent of everything else. The mass of an object should be the same whenever and wherever you measure it. That means that mass is separable from all other dimensions. When we get to relativity theory, that doesn't hold anymore. So there's, there's, there's a, a change. But these, these um, ideas about separability are tightly connected to uh, measurement theory. 
Uh, Frank and I never developed this, and I'm, I'm still hoping that somebody wants to develop this connection, but maybe we can discuss that uh, uh, later. Uh, so, that's an idea of what constitutes a theory. Now, theories are developing over time. And we have classified these changes of the theory into five types. So the first one is just adding new laws to a theory or deleting uh, laws of that. that uh, and laws in this case are equations connecting, connecting uh, dimensions, as I mentioned. Then, of course, you can change the dimensions by changing the scale or, or metric. You can change the scale, the structure of the underlying. Uh, uh, dimensions. And I'll give you examples in, in just a second. And then, that's another more, I should call it sociological uh, aspect. Uh, certain dimensions are considered more important than others. And there is a change over, over, over time of which are the more de de dependent ones uh, and which are the more fundamental dimensions in a theory. They, they can be defined in terms of each other. So we know that from Newtonian mechanics. I'll give you an example. I can already now reveal that the notion of energy was not part of the beginning in the first versions of Newtonian particle mechanics. But during the centuries, the notion of energy became much more central, even to Newtonian uh, uh, theories. There can be changes in separability. I already talked a little bit about that. And then finally, uh, 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 the most dramatic change of the theory is to add a new dimension or a new domain, or maybe throw, throw away. That would be a really radical change in the theory, because now, now the underlying structure may change totally, and you can formulate new equations and so on if you add new dimensions. So this is, in our account, the most radical form of change on, on the theory. So let me do this. Uh, uh, yeah, and I, they are often, when you, when you change this, you change the measurement procedures. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples of how this, is, uh, how this is done. So now I want to say a little bit more about each of these five changes. So adding and deleting laws. So if you take Newtonian theory, adding Hooke's string law or the pendulum law is, is, is extending the empirical content of the theory. You add new variables, uh, the length of the pendulum or whatever. Or including, you can formulate mathematical laws that, that connect the variables. That makes the empirical content of the, of the uh, uh, theory uh, stronger. And that's, that's, the, that's the rationale for this change. It increases the empirical content of the theory. But it's part of normal science, as Kuhn would say it. Uh, and it's no change of the theory framework. You keep all the dimensions, you keep all the assumptions about the dimensions. Nothing changed. Just add new laws. And for a positivist, this would be scientific progress, I mean, adding, adding uh, new, new laws. But that's not the only one. We have changes of scales. So when thermal and dimensions developed, we changes from Celsius or Fahrenheit scale to Kelvin. And Kelvin is different in structure because Kelvin has a zero point. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a Celsius and in interval scale. Kelvin is a, it's a ratio scale, it, or maybe not a ratio scale, but at least it has a, a zero point. So it has a different structure than, than the Celsius and Fahrenheit uh, scales. And again, this increases the empirical content. We know now, if we have a Kelvin scale thermodynamic idea, that there is a lowest temperature. That was not part of the uh, original uh, ideas about temperature. Change is important of dimension. Uh, yeah. Fundamental dimensions may become derived and, and, and vice versa. So for Newton, force was a, uh, the most fundamental dimension in his, um, in his theory. And he was criticized by his contemporaries because force was something mystic, he couldn't see it and so on. Actually, Newton borrowed the term force from, from theology and that was kind of suspicious uh, uh, to use such, a, such a notions. And some people wanted to get rid of this, and then there are different there are variations of, of Newtonian particle mechanics when you don't have forces as, as uh, uh, primitive. But uh, you take uh, the second law as a definition of force instead. And, and the right. Um, this is part of the debate of the ontology of the theory. I mean, in, in Philosophy of science, we sometimes talk about theoretical variables and empirical variables. 
course, it's clearly a, a theoretical variable. It's not directly observable. You have to infer it from uh, other other observations. Uh, but so, in the debate, philosophical debate around theories, uh, discussing what are the fundamental uh, variables is part of the of, of the, uh, the ontology. What discussing on what really is fundamental in the universe. Uh, so that's more a, a philosophical. But it also, I mean, these discussions may prepare unification with other things, and I'll, I'll get back to, I'll get back to that. Uh, separability. Uh, when uh, Newton formulated this theory, heat was not very well understood in, in, in <coughs> physics. Uh, it was a totally different uh, notion. You could measure the temperature of things and so on. It was not part of the uh, uh, Newtonian theory at all. But then. When thermodynamics was developed, uh, heat became possible to define in, 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 as, as a mean kinetic energy. So heat was totally separable before thermodynamics, then when thermodynamics was kind of integrated with particle mechanics, then you got uh, heat as a, as a non-separable integral, which you could define it within the, within the, uh, as mean kinetic energy. Uh, oh, okay, same thing again. We understand now that heat can be seen as, as something uh, built up from the structure of, of uh, 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 another theory. And again, that may prepare unification. Finally, addition and addition <coughs> of, of uh, dimensions. In particle mechanics is particle mechanics, but when we have, uh, yeah, okay, maybe I should say first. Of when Newton formulated his theory, he made a distinction between mass and weight. And that was not done before. He, 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 he realized that we can talk about mass of the celestial bodies and so on, but discussing their weight is, is, is not the same thing. And weight is something that we can measure on, on our planet, basically. Uh, so he made this distinction between mass and weight. So he introduced and that mass is more or less a theoretical variable in, in Newtonian mechanics as, uh, as well. So already when he formulated, so force is definitely a new variable that he adds, but even mass is, is, is a new variable. Then in the 19th century, some people spoke about the ether, so it's a sort of way of solving certain problems, but the, the ether didn't solve any problems, so it was uh, disappeared uh, fairly quickly uh, again. Uh, again, this may prepare unification, but whether this addition of a variable or not is only uh, can only be evaluated when we have seen what's happened to the theory. It can only be evaluated post hoc, not during a, 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 a normal period, so to speak, of the science. So, that's a description of the five types of changes of the theory that we can see. I mean, I give you some examples for Newtonian theory, some examples for some, some other theories. But now I want to focus on, on this case study of what happened from when Newton formulated his theory until we got into Einstein's uh, special relativity theory. So, uh, this is, I've already shown you this slide, this is the beginning, the, the original structure of the Newtonian theory. Now, what happened was that Newton formulated, oh, he, no, he didn't formulate, he derived from his second law, he derived that momentum is invariant uh, uh, of, of time. In, in, in a particle system. Leibniz proposed the invariance of kinetic energy as, a, as a, a, another invariance that holds up. But that's not derivable within the Newton system. You have to add to have that as a, a special law. So this is a type 1 change. I mean, you add the, the uh, invariance of the kinetic energy as a law to, uh, to uh, uh, the Newtonian system. And then you get the richer content, you can make more predictions uh, from the theory. Nowadays, we count that as part of the, of the uh, Newtonian uh, theory, but it wasn't originally. That's that. So, now, kinetic energy. We can define that with using the, uh, the, the uh, uh, eight dimensions. But still, now we focus on this notion of kinetic energy. And so people begin already then to talk more about energy than uh, originally. So there is a little bit of a change of the importance of certain, certain variables here. Uh, 
And then later, we have reformulations in the 19th century of the Newtonian mechanics in the Lagrange and, and Hamiltonian reformulations. You have in potential energy and, and in, in kinetic energy. They are then, the forces that are now out from the formulations, and it's all focused on, on these energy principles. So in these reformulations, force has, you can define force via the second law, what you like. Uh, and the, the basic, the, the basic, what's thought to be the basic dimensions in these reformulations are, is energy. That's the energy dimension. So we see in the 19th century, we have reformulations that emphasize uh, the, the uh, uh, energy as, as a uh, central variable in, in, in the theory. Uh, then Joule introduced the connection between heat and work. Uh, and, and, uh, so you, you can transform heat to work and work to heat. Um, and that strengthens the principle of the cons conservation of energy. Uh, it's not only kinetic energy, but it's well, it's kinetic in terms of how you define heat. But but anyway, it, when we get to thermodynamics, that's another reason to put more emphasis on, on energy in terms of, of the, the kinetic energy. Uh, yeah, and then of course we have this change uh, of as, that I mentioned already earlier that thermodynamics uh, reduces heat to mean mean. Kinetic energy. Uh, yeah, so adding thermodynamics, I mean, that's not really part of the Newtonian particle mechanics, but it, it, it's part of the process of putting more emphasis on, on the notion of energy. Uh, yeah, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there are temperature changes in, in, in the scale of temperature from the interval scale to the, to the Kelvin scale with, with its zero point. Then comes electromagnetism. Uh, and now we have a theory that introduces a fundamentally new variable, current, or if you like, charge, they are in, 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 into the final here. So now we get the theory, we still have space and time and mass, but we can have a new fundamental dimension that generates electromagnetism. We have Maxwell's laws uh, defining this. But here, also for this theory, this idea of conservation of energy lives also in this theory. So that's taken over. From the, from the particle mechanics uh, to, to, uh, to electromagnetism. Uh, and yeah, that's my theme here. Energy becomes a unified uh, dimension. And then I have this discovery at the end of the 19th century that the mass of heavily charged particles increases. And that's really a revolution or something like a, a problem for Newtonian theory. Because for, for in the Newtonian theory, mass is constant. It never, the mass of an object never changes. And now we get, when we get electricity, electromagnetism into the picture, we have these changes in, in, in mass when you have heavily, heavily charged uh, particles. So there, now there is, in a sense, this is a crack for the Newtonian theory that, that mass, can, uh, mass of an object can change. Uh, but we're not still really in the traditional. Uh, Newtonian theory, because we are now in the electromagnetic, electromagnetic you know, uh, domain. But still, I mean, I hope you see that this is we're beginning to question the, the, the constancy of, 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 of mass. Uh, we talk about fields. Uh, this is just a technical uh, slide saying that we can define fields as a uh, some kind of implement on the conceptual space. So if you have a scalar field, you can think of it as a, in, in a space, uh, uh, conceptual space, you can think of it uh, as, a, uh, as a space, extended space, plus a function. You can define uh, that, but that's, that's a technical point. And similarly, the vector field can be defined as a combination of a space and, uh, and a, a, this vector uh, and then a function here. So uh, it's just a way of getting everything put into the conceptual space frame. But we have to assume certain certain functions here. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I don't know why they show up. But anyway, uh, in Lawrence, uh, Fitzgerald formulate these uh, transformations. Now we're not, now we're leaving the Galilean transformation, and we get we get time uh, depending on velocity here, uh, but. <coughs> 
uh, they are not interpreted in the same way as in, as in relativity theory. They are interpreted as contractions of objects, which is kind of, in retrospect, a little bit odd, but that's how they were interpreted, these, these uh, transformations. Uh, so in, in, in this version, uh, they, the space and time are still considered as separable entities. Uh, you, 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 you solve the problems by talking about these contractions of objects in, 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 in uh, So, very brief uh, story about what happened from Newton until the end of the 19th century. Some of the major steps uh, that I've identified from one of the five types of, of uh, changes in, in, of, of the theory. But I hope you see that yeah, first of all, energy has gradually increased in importance. It's become a fundamental dimension in, in all the theories. I mean, in, in the Hamiltonian Lagrangian, it's uh, fundamental for Newtonian, it's fundamental for thermodynamics, it's for, some fundamental for electromagnetism. So for unified theory, energy is really the, the most important uh, dimension, so to speak. Uh, I talked about that conservation of mass is begin, beginning to be questioned here because of electromagnetism. Uh, and we have seen these Lorentz transformations that make actually space and time integral rather than separate, even if they were not interpreted like that uh, at the beginning. Now comes 1905, it is, uh, where Einstein derives, he starts from two postulates. Speed of light is constant, all laws were the same in all dimensional uh, frames. From this, he derives invariance with respect to uh, Lorentz transformations. And that's yeah, because the speed of light should be, should be constant. Now, in his theory, space and time are considered to be integral. You can't measure a space without taking a uh, location, without taking account of the time frame and so on. Uh, you all know this. Uh, and then he adds the third postulate, conservation of momentum. Uh, that was a derived law in Newton, Newton's theory. But that for Einstein, that's, he doesn't have this Newton's second law, he only has this conservation of momentum. And from there, you can derive, uh, you can derive the, the famous equation and so on. And then we see that energy and mass become interdefinable. They are not separable anymore. Mass becomes the integral with, 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 with energy. Uh, given that we have conservation of, of momentum and the, and the Lorentz uh, transformations. So there is a big change in, the in, in how dimensions are integral and separable when we leave from Newton to uh, Einstein. But the variables are basically the same that preserve some of the properties. So this is, this is the, the big changes in Einstein's uh, uh, theory. So if I summarize, the meaning of, okay, if you go back to Kuhn, his main argument for saying that uh, Einstein's theory is a new paradigm in comparison to Newton is to say that he says that mass, we can't understand the notion of mass in uh, Einstein's theory. It's, it's different, it's incommensurable with the notion of mass in, in uh, uh, Newton's theory. He, know, he uses this notion of incommensurability. And that has been a lot of debate concerning what he means by incommensurability. Uh, yes, it changes. The meaning of mass changes. It's, it's no longer separable and, and so on. Uh, but it's always between, between one dimension and it's always between being uh, measured on the ratio of scale. And we can still talk about Newtonian mass as rest mass. We get the same notion back if we talk about rest mass. Uh, energy gradually replaces forces in fundamental dimension. I've said it several times already. Uh, and the most important thing here is, the, is that I've tried to spell out that the change from the original Newtonian theory to the special relativity theory has been gradual. There has been lots of steps preparing this, uh, this last thing. And of course, Einstein's theory is a totally new theory uh, we, we, because it starts from different postulates and so on. But I hope you, you can see that the structure of the new theory has been prepared quite a lot by looking at the historical development from the uh, 17th century to the, to the early 20th uh, century. Uh, now, this is maybe my main message here, that by using this kind of dimensional geometrical uh, way of representing the theory, 
we can find, we can identify these changes better than we can do if we had had a proposition or a description of theory in terms of sentences. It would be very more difficult to do it because these changes of scales or separability and so on, they are very difficult to describe in terms of, of sentences. But once you talk about them in terms of geometrical topological structures, then we, we can identify these changes. So for me, this is maybe the main, the main reason why I would like to advocate looking at something like conceptual spaces as a way of understanding uh, the, the underlying structure of, of physical theories and maybe some other, other uh, theory areas as well. That's the main motivation for this, uh, for this uh, talk here. Um, finally, the question is then, are these meanings really incommensurable? So, if you take it, look at what is the meaning of mass in classical mechanics. It's measured on a ratio scale, it's separable from other domains, it's conservative, that means it's independent of where and when you uh, measure an object, and it's additive, that means if you take the object, mass of one object to the mass of the other object, to the mass you can just uh, take the addition of the masses. So that's the properties of Newtonian, uh, Newtonian mass notion. If you look at corresponding properties in relativity theory, Mass is split into rest and relativistic mass. Relativistic mass is still measured on a ratio scale. It's not inseparable, it's not conservative, uh, and it's not additive. But it still has some properties that say that make us say physicists use the same term mass, both for the Newtonian and the uh, Einsteinian concept, because there is some kind of continuity and similarity. Mass plays a similar role in, in the equations. And, and so on. Uh, we need new methods to measure mass, mass when we get to uh, relativity theory, but, but still, uh, there is a continuity. These properties have been, uh, the, the uh, conservativity disappeared with, with uh, 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 electromagnetism and so on. They have been changed gradually from, from Newton's time to, to the 20th uh, century. So, I wouldn't say, I mean, this is my reaction to saying that Newtonian mass and Einsteinian mass are incommensurable. They are not really, I mean, there, are, there are differences, that's clear, but they are not so radically different in, in, in meaning as Kuhn wants to uh, have it. So, conceptual space is, is a tool for philosophy of science. I have already said that I think it gives a better account of the dynamics of theories than the uh, positivistic sentential account. Uh, if you are a structural realist, you can talk about what the structure is. I mean, this is also an answer to uh, the question of what is the structure of the theory. And by uh, formulating in, in terms of conceptual spaces, you, you can identify the structure in a clearer way, I think, than in, in most other, other things. So, that's my story on, on how to use conceptual spaces to describe the theory. Thank you very much.